Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. And um, thanks for having us here today. All of the talks that I've managed to listen to so far have just been absolutely fantastic. And it's great to have so much variety. So yeah, we're very honored to be included in the list of speakers today. So Ben and I are talking to you today as co-chairs of the Public Perception Committee about mining um, through the Critical Minerals Association. So I won't talk too much about the CMA. Um, I believe on Friday morning, Jeff and Kirsty, who are the founders of the Critical Minerals Association, will be talking to you in much more detail about the work that they're doing. But in a nutshell, it was formed just over about 12 months ago, involves people from the domestic mining industry in the UK, as well as people who are headquarters in the UK, but working internationally. And it's doing great things to get mining onto you know, the government's agenda. Critical raw materials are going to play such a huge part in this energy transition. And so they're doing a really good job at actually making sure that the government are thinking about how to source them responsibly. Ben and I co-chair the Public Perception Committee and in the last 12 months we've actually been doing quite a lot of work. We'll talk to you about some of the there's some amazing resources out there so we've been trying to pull all of them together we've been trying to have conversations with people associated with the mining industry but not directly and we're really keen to encourage as many young people as possible to study stem subjects and to actually consider going into the mining industry as an interesting place for their career um, a lot of our members are doing fantastic things around the perception of mining and stakeholder engagement and things around our, you know, our own specific projects. Cornish Lithium, where I work, we're doing work in Cornwall, for example, around our projects down here. Um, but the CMA is really an opportunity for us to pool all of this enthusiasm and resource from our membership base to try and go and spread this message a bit wider. It's great that we, you know, we're kind of preaching to the choir here. We all believe that the mining industry is necessary and we're all vested, we've all got vested interest in doing it as responsibly as possible, which is fantastic. But we need to have those conversations with the wider public and we're trying to find ways to do that. So I'm gonna hand over to Ben now to talk about some of the specific work that we've been doing so far, but we would love for people who are listening to this to actually get involved with us. If you've got any ideas for what we can do, um, let's chat afterwards. So Ben, over to you. Super, thanks Lucy. And yeah, on the screen you can see here um, some groups of people, uh, stakeholders that we have uh, classified and, and these are the groups that we've, we've kind of targeted as part of the CMA public perception group. So to start with, we'll have a little look at uh, young people. Um, and yeah, young people have, have proven that they are very willing to fight for their future and demanding change. Um, we as the minerals industry need to follow their lead really and, and help to empower them through knowledge to ensure that they will make you know, well-informed decisions. So taking from Professor Stewart's talk yesterday, swoon, um, we have to turn knowledge-driven education into problem-driven participation. That really stuck with me yesterday. So um, the pro big problem with, um, with young people is the connection. And uh, so here's some, some good examples that we've pulled together um, and they're by other companies that have made them and we're just trying to pull them together. And on the CMA website as a, specific place that we've we've put all these so uh, first of all looking at the getting geoscience into education and into schools into home education is difficult um, but there are many uh, different companies and initiatives out there um, things such as the um, eu funded briefcase game uh, which ha actually has physical briefcases and, and also an online game that you can um, you can do with with school age kids uh, Time for Geography is a um, organization which which creates video content for, for schools using academics and um, industry participants. Um, the Geo Bus is a physical bus, one in London, one in uh, Scotland at the moment, uh, who are going out to schools um, and actually providing um, uh, multidisciplinary kind of workshops for, for school kids. And then obviously STEM as well. And there's so many different um, initiatives that STEM have. Um, Minecraft, I mean, everyone loves video games, particularly young people. So Minecraft is a game about mining. So why aren't we using it more? It just doesn't, it, for me, it's just so obvious. And, uh, and the BGS, the British Geological Survey and the, the SGU, the Swedish Geological Survey have both created mods and add-ins to the game to actually make it more geological and have more of a, uh, a real context to um, to the, the Minecraft world. So have a look at those if, uh, if you haven't seen them. 
Um, charities working specifically to improve diversity and inclusion uh, by targeting kids in deprived areas, uh, such as two here, the Blair Projects and the Social Mobility Foundation, who the, the CMA have both been in touch with, um, are providing opportunities and we can interact with those guys um, to get our message out to, um, to these, these areas that otherwise we wouldn't maybe otherwise. Um, now, social media and, and apps, you know, that's a real tough nut to crack um, for industry. You know, LinkedIn is the, obviously the preferred method of choice for professionals, but young people don't use it. So, so using things such as YouTube, um, Twitter, is difficult, but our friend um, Mystery Doug here, for example, on YouTube, you know, really tries to boil down very complex things into short, snappy videos. And uh, you've got to make it short and sharp, bish, bash, bosh, um, to, to get your message across. Uh, and then um, artwork as well. Many young people use art to express themselves. So uh, this could be a way to, to get to a group of people who otherwise we, we wouldn't reach. So I'll hand over to Lucy for the general public. Thank you, Ben. And hopefully my internet is stable enough for you to all hear me. Okay. Um, are you able to click through onto the general public bit? Yep, we're there. Okay, I can't see it. Oh, there we go. Um, right, so the general public, how on earth do we reach people outside of this bubble of engaged and enthusiastic people who are involved in the mining industry, because we've almost got our own echo chamber. And well, there are ways to do that. And we're starting to really look into this through the, through the CMA. So projects such as the Eden Project, for example, are fantastic. It's one of the biggest tourist destinations in the Southwest, if not the biggest. And it's in an old China clay pit and it makes the most of its heritage. Um, museums are a fantastic way to reach you know, whole swathes of society. I think I read somewhere once that actually engaging with primary school age children is one of the best ways to educate to educate adults because children will go home and talk to their parents about what they've learned at school that day. And it's a fantastic way to reach people. So museums where you've got exhibitions dedicated to critical raw materials or the energy transition, they can be a brilliant way to reach whole swathes of society. And I think there's a real opportunity here for us to engage proactively with some of these museums. The Natural History Museum, the Science Museum, they're already doing brilliant things to do with the energy transition and the roles that minerals have to play in that. Locally, we've got the National Museum of Wales, we've got the Royal Cornwall Museum, all of them are interested in doing things, but that's something that I think we can champion as a community and actually go out and see if we can facilitate some of these exhibitions happening. And then you've got online events such as this, such as, you know, ones that can mining make the world a greener place, we just need to advertise them to people who aren't necessarily within our echo chamber. And then finally, on this point, because I'm very short of time. The Technology Metals for a Green Future project, this is a massive open online course that's been spearheaded by the University of Exeter, and they've had a fantastic take of this. There are so many resources out there to enable education about critical raw materials and why they're so important. We're trying to bring them all together and just raise visibility of them. And then finally, um, sorry, I said it was the last one, but I meant the second to last. There's also social media, and I know we've spoken about that before. There's national press, but doing things such as talks on YouTube or TED Talks or trying to get involved in reports that your local news media might be doing about UK based projects or about the impacts of what we're consuming has on our daily lives. I think there's a lot of opportunity to do this around the energy transition. So it's one way that we can maybe get in touch with audiences that wouldn't necessarily turn up to a mining conference about responsible sourcing. So, Ben, back over to you. Um, yeah, thanks, Lucy. And so the next category then, uh, steaming through is, is government, quite a big one there, and they clearly have a major role to play in how the mineral industry operates in the UK and internationally. Um, and the CMA has made you know big strides in this area by creating connections between uh, the mineral supply chain companies and government and linking with all the parliamentary party group on, on um, critical minerals. Um, and through this, we've had a direct voice to MPs and institutions who make decisions. Um, and the CMA through Satala, through Sarah and team, uh, ran a Mining 101 course to MP researchers um, that hopefully will become a permanent fixture in government and with other institutions. 
And we have a big opportunity here this year in the UK with COP26 and G7, uh, where we can interact um, on a more international basis as well. Um, so then moving on to the industry peers, Lucy. Yeah, so there are, we're not the only group trying to improve this public perception of the mining industry. Of course, we're not. The IOM3 are doing fantastic work. The JOLSOC are doing fantastic work. Young mining professionals, I know Kat was on the panel last night, um, women in mining, all of these groups are kind of separately trying to, you know, fight against this negative public perception of the mining industry that we know is out there. Um, I haven't got too much time to go into more detail on it now, but potentially we can ask about it in questions in a moment. But there are fantastic initiatives out there. We're not trying to replace that. We just want to make sure that we're complementing it, supporting other initiatives, and just really trying to get everybody's voice heard. Absolutely. And um, another category that, yeah, you know, I think the mining industry has been, the minerals industry has been particularly um, challenged with is connected with NGO, um, given that it's, it's often a an abrasive um, discussion between the two parties, but they're absolutely critical in terms of providing voice to stakeholders who otherwise would struggle to be heard, you know, be it local communities, indigenous peoples, artisanal small scale miners, the, even the flora and fauna, they don't have a voice. So NGOs are, are there to really, really help out. So we need to, as we have through this conference, you know, had WWF and the London Mining Network, which is fantastic to get uh, these organizations in the, at the same table for discussions and to actually have that debate rather than just, you know, uh, mudslinging on, on social media or, or anything like that. You know, we need to have proper discussions about um, both sides of the, the coin. Um, so lastly, then um, we just wanted to, to pull out a few things that we found in terms of communication then. Um, th there's a few things we have observed, um, you know, putting, putting the head above the parapet um, as one that's come up quite frequently of, you know, mining companies, particularly, you know, there's obviously been a lot of failures, big scale failures uh, recently we all know about, but there's also been a lot of successes. And I think it gets drowned out um, often and maybe rightly so as well. But, you know, if we don't put the, the head above the parapet and talk about some of the successes as well as the failures um, and listen to what stakeholders are telling us back, then uh, we're not going to go forward. So having that transparent uh, conversation is is key. Um, on the other side of our, the argument, then is um, you know we don't want to be seen as just lecturing and um, definitely not greenwashing. We need to talk about the elephants in the room. We need to talk about the negative incidents, uh, discuss what's happened, and then uh, work a way a uh, way forward. Um, so we want to try and avoid those things. So lastly, for me then. Um, this actually comes from um, the Geologize Practical Geocommunications course run by uh, Dr. Hayden Mort, which I recommend to, uh, to anyone out there. But this really stuck with me that the, the two ways that um, scientists and the public um, look at presentations. So from our perspective, maybe as scientists, you know, we love to pile on the detail, do big introductions, and then we kind of think about the conclusions right at the end. Whereas the public, if you want to have a, an engaging uh, communication with the public, you've got to hook them. Why is it relevant to them? You know, you've got to use emotion to, to get them engaged um, and then leave the important details to, uh, to afterwards. But, you know, the point is getting that hook in, which um, I just love. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it to, to Lucy then to, to wrap up. Thanks, Ben. So this has been a bit of a whistle stop tour of what we've been trying to do with the CMA over the past year. and. You know, you can see that there are some fantastic resources out there that the mining industry and various people have created. What we now need to do is work out how on earth do we get audiences to see them? It's impossible to get mining into the curriculum, but, you know, it can align with chemistry lessons. There are aspects that can align with geography lessons or biology lessons. Let's get that, see if we can get that in let teachers know what resources are out there. But equally, if anybody listening to this has got ideas as to how we can reach those audiences with these fantastic resources that are out there and you know the enthusiasm of everybody who attends a conference like this how can we harness that and actually start to have these conversations about how critical mining is but how critical it is that we do it as responsibly as possible because we're going to have to do a hell of a lot of it over the next few decades if we want to facilitate this energy transition so 
Thanks very much for listening. And if anybody has any questions, I realise we've talked for quite a long time, but we can talk for hours more if you like. So um, yeah, thanks thank very you. much. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so, so much, Lucy and Ben. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together from behind your muted microphones for the fabulous Lucy and Ben. Um, and I have to say, I mean, I think the, the, the variety of material that you've managed to pull together and um, just over the last short while, really, because the Critical Mind and Minerals Association has only been going, what, just over a year? Um, and what's been achieved through those different working groups is, is really exciting. Now, there are a number of comments coming in through chat and the Q&A, et cetera, as well. Um, and I think I'm going to go with a, a comment or a question that's come in from Erin Hood. And Erin asks, what advice would you give young geoscientists, for example, undergraduates, who are trying to promote sustainable mining? I'll ask Lucy's topic right It's there. a really good question. <laughs> no, it's a really good question. And, you know, I think that's something that actually, as young geoscientists, you've got a real opportunity to talk to even younger potential geoscientists. Um, you know, by the time that people have chosen what they want to study at university or if they want to go to university, it's almost too late. Obviously, it's not too late, but actually we need to be encouraging more students and more diverse range of students as well to study STEM subjects. You know, we need more girls to do STEM subjects and we need more people from diverse backgrounds to do them as well and consider mining as a possible career. So one potential step that you could do is going back into your old schools, for example, giving a talk about what you're doing and the whole variety of stuff that you learn as a geoscience student. And, you know, just start the conversation about is that whole, if something hasn't been grown then it's been mined and it does all boil down to that and just so many people don't necessarily realize that and then you can start to open up those conversations about you know a lot of young people today are very keen and interested it seems in having careers that will you know they feel like they're doing something good they're not going to contribute to climate change they don't want to work for an oil and gas company but actually there are many positive things that if they did want to become a geoscience that they can really promote in a sustainable way through the tools that they develop as a geoscientist in training. So look at groups like Women in Mining, look at groups like Young Mining Professionals, join them because, you know, they've got great routes and mechanisms for you to be able to go back into old schools and do talks and can provide slides and things for you and the Critical Minerals Association as well. But yeah, just by turning up to things like this, you're educating yourself and becoming involved in that conversation as well. So it's a huge start. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Lucy. Ben, have you got anything to add? Well, just just that you, you know, universities are having to change their way in terms of the courses they're making, given you know the decline in student numbers, um, and they are rebranding. And I know the University of Derby, for example, you know, have almost shut down their geology uh, kind of degrees and then rebranded it and rebooted it, and with a real focus on sustainability and how it can actually, uh, you know, you need some of the geological geoscience background, but then really putting sustainability front and focus and, um, and changing the emphasis. Fantastic. And just actually building on that, Ben, so you mentioned sort of rebranding or maybe also um, not rethinking, but evolving the way that uh, that perhaps some of the education, etc., happens. And there's a question here from John Clark, um, and it's more of a comment in a way saying that um, actually, how do we move from the university setting to an Internet setting? So using you know, people like Edgemine, for example, who, who have done that very well for many years. Um, but the, the problem almost being is, is how do you make sure that the cost of entry is low enough so that people can be able to get to that education? I don't know if you want to comment on that. Well, well one of the things we talked about just then, the, the massive open on, online course that Francis Wall and the team from CSM, um, Camelot School of Mines, have put together. You know, it's a free course, and, but it's quite detailed. You know, it, it runs over several weeks. It's got a lot of modules on where minerals come from, you know, how we process them. The impacts on the environment and, um, and local communities so that is a yeah, they're a free course and yeah okay it's not a master's or it's not a, a university de degree but it's a it, it's a tangible course which will teach a lot um, and it can be yeah done for free and in your own time so that's one method um, yeah Fantastic. So I know there is so much more that we could talk yeah. about and the questions continue to come in. I should also mention as well that 
Um, next week, there is an Edge of Mine course running um, on responsible mining. And yes, um, I will actually be delivering that. So if you haven't heard enough from me this week, then do look at the Edge of Mine website and um, feel free to sign up for that. But Lucy and Ben, absolutely fantastic as always. Thank you so, so much. So round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for the wonderful Lucy Crane and Ben Lepley. Brilliant.